I know I said some time ago that I didn't want to cross-contaminate this channel with stuff that didn't directly pertain to Darktable, but I've had quite a number of requests and or suggestions that you guys would like to see a video about my process for shooting multi-image panoramas. So, let's do it. Hi, and welcome to episode 73 of Understanding Darktable. As you are about to see, I recorded the majority of this episode on the harbour front, uh, on Sydney Harbour, basically. And, yeah, over to me. I imagine this is going to be a three-part series. In this first episode, we are going to look at the gear that you need, the gear that you don't need, some best practices, and the process of actually shooting the multi-image sequence. In the second episode, we'll look at then preparing those source images for stitching and the process of actually stitching all of those source images together into a panorama. And then in the third episode, we'll look at bringing that finished panorama back into Darktable for post-processing. Now, to my mind, there are two equipment lists, not one. The first equipment list is the absolutely non-negotiable, gotta have equipment list. And you may be surprised to know that in my mind, that consists of just three things. One, a camera with manual focus and manual exposure control. Two, a lens of in 35 mil terms, at least 30 mil focal length. Anything too wide causes us issues later on down the track, and we'll come to that later in the episode. And number three, a memory card. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Bruce, tripod. Tripod's essential. Well, in my opinion, no, it's actually not. It certainly is under certain circumstances, but at a crush, you can shoot a multi-image pano handheld. Obviously, that limits it to daytime when you can get at least a decent shutter speed. For me, I don't want to hand, held, hand hold anything slower than maybe a 50th of a second. There are some people who can hand hold much slower than that, and if you can, good luck to you. All right, so moving on to the non-essential but nice to have list, the number one item would be a tripod. Now, the tripod is one thing in and of itself, but more important than the tripod is what type of head you put on it. Obviously, if you're gonna shoot with a tripod, you've gotta have a head of some description. And as I mentioned earlier, ball heads and pistol grip heads are not great. And the reason they're not great for multi-image panos is because you're adjusting all three axes every time you unlock them. The beauty of something like this Manfrotto 460MG is that I've got three individual axis controls for your roll and pitch. The beauty of this, when we're shooting a multi-image pano, is that we can lock off pitch and roll and all we are affecting then is our yaw. So let me just explain those terms if they're unfamiliar to you. Pitch is forward and backward tilt. Roll is left and right tilt, so our horizon. And yaw is the rotation on that vertical axis. When we're shooting a multi-image pano, we only want to adjust the yaw. Okay, so this is my preferred type of head of the regular sorts of tripod heads. Now let's look at the real deal. This is the Nodal Ninja 3 Mark III. And big thanks to Anthony from iPanoramic here in Australia uh, for the loan of this device because I've heard of these but I've never owned one. And I reached out to Anthony and said, I want to do this series of videos. Uh, can you hook me up with one just for demonstration purposes? And he sent me a brand new one. These things are amazing. What you can do with these is adjust the 
horizontal position of the camera body, which eventually mounts on this uh, base plate here, so that you can get the center line of your lens directly over this spirit level on the top of the tripod. What we're trying to do when we shoot a multi-image panorama is rotate our yaw over what is called the nodal point of the lens. Now, the nodal point, and I, I don't really understand the physics of this, but as I understand it, it's the point down the length of the lens where the light rays cross over. If you shoot a multi-image pano and you don't rotate around the nodal point of the lens, you get what's called parallax error. And parallax error is where two objects which should be in a straight line, when you move them to the side of one frame, they appear to not be lined up. And when you shoot round to this position, they're like that, but when they're in the middle, they're lined up. That's parallax error. If you can position the lens so that the nodal point of the lens is directly over the center column of your tripod, you'll eliminate the parallax error. So that's what this is designed to do. And we can also adjust the position of our camera body forwards and backwards. There is a little stop here that we can adjust if we need to move further forward. And that allows us to get the nodal point of our lens directly over this spirit level. Then on the base, there are markings at two and a half degree increments all the way around. And you'll notice that this is notched. It actually turns according to how you have these knobs here set. And basically you can set it to two and a half degree increments, five degree, 10 degree, and you can also get to degrees of rotation in between those values, again, by adjusting these, which is outside the scope of this video. But the beauty of this is that we can get our lens positioned correctly over the nodal point, and we can then shoot at very precise intervals between all of the source frames in our multi-image sequence. All right, so that's it for the tripod heads. The next thing that I would put on the not essential but recommended list is a cable release. Now, you can pick up a third party one of these for most cameras off eBay for probably around about $30 to $40. The beauty of having something like this is that you remove the possibility of introducing camera shake at the time of capture by having your finger on the trigger. Now, I cannot tell you how many times I've gone out, shot a multi-image sequence, got home to stitch it together, and found that just one frame out of what might have been a you know, nine or 10 frame sequence has absolutely ruined the whole thing because of camera shake. So definitely worth grabbing one of these if you can. Next up, a lens pen. Now, I'm not being paid to promote the lens pen, but I have used one of these products or something similar to it for probably the last 10 years. The beauty of a lens pen is that, well, they're designed for cleaning the sensor of your camera. Now, if you're shooting with a bridge camera that doesn't have an interchangeable lens, then that's not gonna be an issue for you. But if you are shooting with something with an interchangeable lens, please make sure that that sensor is clean before you go out to shoot a multi-image pano. Again, there have been way too many times that, than I care to imagine or remember where I've had dirt on the sensor. And if you think it's painful getting rid of, you know, 10 or 15 dust spots off the sensor from a single image, wait till you've got to do those same 10 or 15 adjustments on a 10 image sequence. It gets painful. So if possible, before you go out to shoot, take the lens off the camera, give the sensor a clean, put the lens back on, and if possible, don't take that lens off again until after you've shot your multi-image sequence. The last item 
on the not essential but definitely worth having list, a lint-free lens cloth. Uh, you can pick up these from your local optometrist, they pretty much give them away. If you're shooting near water, as we are going to be later on, or if you are shooting in rain, it is conceivable that you will end up with small droplets of water on the front element of the lens. And depending on the aperture that you're shooting at, if you're shooting at a wide aperture, you will end up with these big sort of washed out splotches where the light has refracted through that water droplet and they are really painful to try and remove. I'll insert here a panorama I shot many years ago from over the other side of the harbour there at Lady Macquarie's chair at about five o'clock in the morning and I had some droplets of water on just a couple of the frames in that sequence and they were really troublesome to try and remove. Okay, the gear to avoid. Number one on this list is a circular polarizing filter. Now, yes, they look amazing in bright sunny days in the middle of the day because they give you those rich saturated blues. But the problem with a circular polarizer is that the saturation of the blue varies from one side of the frame to the other. And when you shoot with one of those filters, a multi-image sequence, when you come to stitching all of those images together, you get this undulating blue in the saturation across the sky. Not a good look. You can spend hours trying to correct it in post. It's just easier to not bother shooting with a circular polarizer. In the same vein, graduated neutral density filters. If you are shooting, on a head like the Manfrotto 460MG or the Nodal Ninja where you know that your pitch and your roll are going to remain fixed and you are only adjusting the yaw, then you can get away with shooting with a graduated neutral density filter. And that can be helpful if you've got a bright sky and you just need to push that down a bit so that you're getting more exposure on your foreground. But if you are shooting handheld, it can be problematic because if you adjust the position of the horizon between frames then the position of the graduated neutral density filter is also going to shift between successive frames of the sequence and again that's going to cause problems when you try to stitch it all together at the end. Number three, lenses that are wider than 30 mil. You can use them if you have identified the nodal point and you've managed to alleviate any parallax error. But what you will find is that because they have such a wide angle of view, anything that is close to you will not stitch nicely because there's just physics. <laughs> I can't put it any better than that. Try and stick to at least a 30 mil focal length if you can. And to be honest, I generally shoot all of my panos at 50 mil. And in my opinion, the ideal lens for shooting multi-image panos is a nifty 50, a 50 mil prime lens. Because it's prime, the focal length cannot change on you. And they're just a great lens. You don't get that massive wide angle distortion. They just work beautifully. Unfortunately, I no longer have a nifty 50 because in 2017 in Paris, some mongrel thought he deserved my camera gear more than I did. So I don't have one. So I'm going to be shooting today's panorama on a Tamron 28 2.8 lens, but I will be shooting at around about a 50 mil focal length. All right, let's talk about best practices. Number one, orientation. If you've never shot multi-image panos before, you might think it's normal to just shoot in a landscape orientation. But actually, that's not the best approach. The best approach is to shoot each frame in a portrait orientation if you are shooting what will be a landscape panorama. If you were going to shoot a vertical panorama, then you would shoot in a landscape format. The idea of shooting in a portrait orientation is that you increase the spread of top to bottom across each frame. So 
it's, I guess, recommended to try and shoot a little wider than you think you want because when you come to stitching all of the frames together, you're going to find that there'll be all these weird scalloped edges when your stitching software is finished stitching all of these frames together. So having the frames just a little bit wider composition than you think you need will give you some room to crop out those scalloped edges at the end so that we end up with a nice rectangular panorama. Number two, the file format. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know I'm a huge fan of shooting RAW over JPEG. The reason for that is that JPEG is an 8-bit format and there's only so far you can push and pull the exposure in post without it completely falling apart. If you shoot on RAW, depending on what camera and what model you're shooting with, you're either going to have 10, 12, 14 or maybe even 16 bits of data to play with. That's going to give you a lot more room to locally adjust exposure. Maybe you need to lighten the foreground because it's dark or you need to push the sky down or whatever it might be. So definitely shoot RAW. The other advantage to shooting RAW is that I've been going back just in the last week or so and looking at multi-image panos that I shot over 10 years ago that I thankfully shot in RAW. The great thing about revisiting those panos now is that raw processing has come so far that I'm getting better results out of those raw files today than I did when I first processed them 10 years ago. And that could quite easily be the same for you. Shoot raw today because you don't know what you're going to be able to do with that information later on down the track. Third, white balance. Yes, you could shoot auto white balance, but the problem that I have found in the past is that even when you are shooting within one particular scene, the white balance will change from frame to frame if you're using an auto white balance setting. Now, if you paid attention to the previous tip, which was to shoot in RAW, then it's not that big a deal because you can adjust the white balance after the fact. But if you've shot JPEG, on an auto white balance, you will find that the white balance will not be identical frame to frame and your ability to adjust that in post is not as great as it is with a RAW file. For that reason, I recommend that you either go with one of the white balance presets in your camera, so choose daylight or shady or cloudy or whatever it is, or use a white card. With this, you can in post-production, take a reading off the white card and get your white balance from that and then set that for every frame in the sequence and then you'll know that your white balance was consistent across the entire sequence. Next up, the overlap. This is really important. At a minimum, you want 30% overlap between what's on the right-hand edge of this frame to what's on the left-hand edge of the next frame. If you don't supply enough overlap between successive frames, the stitching software is going to have trouble finding consistent parts of the composition between one frame and the next. Personally, I'll shoot with about a 50% overlap. So whatever's on the right half of my first frame will be the left half of my next frame. Your mileage may vary. And it will come down to the focal length that you're shooting at. But bear in mind, 30% as a minimum. Next up, the direction in which you shoot. Shoot from left to right. Now you might think that sounds like an odd thing to make up a rule for, but the reason for it is that when you import all of your images into Darktable, Lightroom, or whatever other software you're using, all of your thumbnails are laid out from left to right. So if you've shot your panoramic sequence from left to right, you'll be able to look at all the thumbnails in your image manager and immediately get an idea of what that panorama is gonna look like. The last time I was down here on Sydney Harbour and I shot the bridge and Circular Quay and the Opera House, 
I was still learning and I shot it from right to left. And so when I look in Darktable, I see the right hand image displayed on the left and then the next <laughs> and it's all back to front. So definitely shoot from left to right. And the last tip as a best practice is to shoot manual focus. Now, the reason I suggest a manual focus is because depending on what is actually in your panoramic sequence of images, there might be some stuff, particularly on your first and last frame, that is much closer to your camera than what's in the middle section of frames of the sequence. If you're shooting in autofocus, it means that the focal point is going to change between frames. Now, if you're shooting at a narrow aperture like f11 or f13, that's probably not such a big deal, but I still just like the idea of setting a manual focus point, and then it doesn't matter if there's some stuff that's close and some stuff that's further away, the focal point will remain consistent across all of those source images. All right. The sun is almost on the horizon, so I think it's time we went and shot. Because I have got my friend Kate doing all of the video stuff on my A7 III, I'm going to be shooting today with my A850. And if you've been following my channel, you know that I've had this camera since it was brand new. That was like 11 years ago, but it will do the job for what I need it to do today. Let's go. Okay, so I'm finally ready to shoot my sequence. I'm going with a sixth of a second at f10 at 200 ISO. I've set manual focus, I've got my cable release, and that's two frames. And rotate, rotate. All right, so that's my sequence, and what I've realized is that this end of the sequence is brighter than that end of the sequence, which means that at a sixth of a second, I've actually overexposed some of these frames at the right-hand end of the sequence. So I'm going to shoot that again, and I'm going to go down to a thirteenth of a second, and I'll just do a quick sample shot to check it for exposure. That's much better. Now I can come back to the start of my sequence and so that is sort of a trap for young players and I should know better because I've done this often enough. When you look at the scene that you are composing, ask yourself which of these frames is going to have the most light in it and meter for that part of the sequence before you worry about shooting the rest of the sequence. Because at the end of the day, the last thing you want in a multi-image pano is to clip your highlights. So, so meter for the brightest part of the sequence and then shoot the entire sequence with those settings. Do not adjust your exposure or your aperture for the other end of the shot. Even though it might look like it's underexposed, just trust your judgment and go with it. And like I said, if you're shooting in RAW, you'll have the ability to pull that exposure up in post. Okay, so that is my sequence shot with the Nodal Ninja. Now I'm going to swap out the tripod for the Manfrotto head and I'm just going to explain how you would do the same thing with one of those types of heads. Okay, so I'm ready to shoot my second sequence. The sky is much darker now so I need to reconsider my exposure. I'm also going to break my own rule. I'm not using a 10 stop filter but what I've got here is a 6 stop circular polarizer from Breakthrough Photography and I'm hoping that now that the sun has gone down using a circular polarizer isn't going to cause me the aforementioned issues from earlier in this episode. If they do then I'll be a victim of disobeying my own rule. But I'm going to give it a go because I really do want to smooth out the water. So 
I've calculated that I'm going to need around about a 10 to 12 second exposure for each frame of this sequence. Now, if you have a look at the top of this tripod head, I don't know if you can see it in the dark, but there is a little, let me get my handy flashlight here on my phone, right here on top of the tripod there's a little indent and we've got these 15 degree markings that make up a compass face and basically what we want to do is adjust the yaw and line it up with one of these dots and then we can do 15 degree increments and we just lock our yaw off with each frame so let's do that okay so as you can see, I made a couple of mistakes in the process of trying to shoot all of this episode. And what I also found was that because I was working in fading daylight, the amount of time that it was going to take to shoot the pano the way I would have liked with a 10-stop filter and with long exposure noise reduction turned on would have meant that the entire process dragged out to about two hours to shoot all of the source frames. And the problem with doing that is that you would have started at the left-hand side of the panorama with still blue sky, ad admittedly blue hour sky, like the sun was down over the horizon, but still daylight lit sky, you know, on the left edge, but by the time you got round to the right-hand end of the panorama, it would have been a completely black sky. So had I started shooting, say, an hour later, when the sky was already dark, it probably would have been okay to take the time to shoot that sequence the way I wanted to do it, except for other factors of, like, what I needed to get done that night. Um, so as a result, I ended up, you know shooting with a six-stop circular polarizer, broke my own rule. Whether or not any of that is going to work, we will find that out in the next episode when we look at the whole process of bringing in our source images, working out what's going to work, what's not going to work, processing those in such a way as to export them ready to stitch. And in this instance, I'm going to be using Hugen. And... We'll then go through that whole process in the next episode. And then, as I mentioned at the start, the third episode will be all about then bringing the finished panorama back into Darktable for post-processing. So, once again, my thanks to Anthony from ipanoramic.com.au. Uh, anyone who is looking for a Fanatec Nodal Ninja, reach out to Anthony. He will set you up. Uh, in your country of choice, I am sure you can find a local distributor. Alrighty, I think that pretty much does it. The Actually, the one thing I should mention is that in this video, all I've covered is shooting one type of panorama, and that is a single row landscape panorama. If you want to get into, you know, astro photography and doing multi-image panos so that you can get you know the entire arch of the milky way core then you need to get into shooting multi-row multi-image panoramas where you shoot one sequence for up high and another sequence for down low and then you stitch all of those together I might actually go out and try that one night, and if it works, I might put an episode together for the patrons uh, that covers that process. To be honest, I've not actually tried to do one of those, but I would imagine that with the Nodal Ninja, it would be pretty easy to do. And the reason I say you would need to do it as a multi-row panorama is because, as I mentioned in this episode, if you shoot with two wide an angle of lens, in other words, too short a focal length, anything that's close to the camera will end up not stitching together nicely. So I, I would imagine that it would make more sense to use a slightly longer focal length and do it as a multi-row panorama rather than trying to shoot 
with a single wide angle lens, like I can get a pretty wide field of view on my 15 mil, but I'm not sure how well I would go getting source frames shot at 15 mil to stitch together. Maybe I should give that a go too. Anyway, lots of things to experiment with. Like I said, I've never had a nodal ninja, so it's a whole new, you know, world of discovery for me. I will leave it there. I'm very much looking forward to the second and third parts of this trilogy of videos. Hopefully, I've shared some information in this video that has been helpful to you and that makes some sense. Uh, and if you are able to employ some of this and go out and successfully shoot some multi-image panos, then, you know, put them up somewhere where everyone can see them and share a link either via the Facebook Darktable unofficial group or, I don't know, send me an email, one or the other. Alrighty, guys, that will do it for this episode, and I will talk to you in the next one.